Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with you in Berlin. We just came this morning by train from Bonn, where we were covering the UN Climate Summit. The summit that, well, it's the first summit that um, the President of the United States announced that he was pulling the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, but it has that very action has rejuvenated, invigorated, um, really coalesced the movements around climate change and global warming, bringing to together many people across the political spectrum. You had governors and mayors and senators from, New from the United States who had all gathered in Bonn to say, it's not only the state, the federal government, all of us are here too. And they've coined the term for their movement, we're still in. And then there's the young people and indigenous activists who came to say precisely the same thing and challenge their elders and their elected leaders, the we're still in movement. But what's so interesting about all of this is that people that were not necessarily in the same room before, right, the, uh, the establishment, where for the last eight years they wouldn't necessarily be in dialogue with young activists. They're all now literally under the same tent. And these conversations are very important, and they're not only American conversations. They're with people all over the world. I don't know if that's what Donald Trump or what many in the United States call 45, the 45th president of the United States intended, but that's precisely what's happening. Now, I want to go back a couple of years, okay, a couple of decades, okay, back to World War II, um, to when Pacifica Radio was founded. That's where I originally come from. I come from Pacifica Radio, founded in 1949 in Berkeley, California, founded by a war resistor named Lou Hill, who when he came out of the detention camp said, there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica was born. Not run by corporations as George Gervner, the late dean of the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania would say, not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so Pacifica Radio was born. The first station, KPFA in Berkeley, 1949. The second station in Los Angeles, 1959 KPFK. The third station, my station in New York, 1960 WBAI Radio. And in the first year of operation um, uh, of WBAI, oh, they were broadcasting a debate between Malcolm X and James Baldwin, the great writer and activist, activist over the effectiveness of nonviolent civil disobedience, the effectiveness of the lunch counter sit-ins in the South. And then there's WPFW in Washington, founded in 1977, and KPFT in Houston. That's the five stations. KPFT in Houston went on the air in 1970. KPFT in Houston, the Petro Metro, the heart of the fossil fuel industry. It goes on the air in 1970 and it makes history. Well, someone does. A few years, a few weeks into the broadcasting of this station, the Ku Klux Klan strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant, which I thought was a good song. But anyway, <laughs> he blow, th they blow it up. And a few weeks later, KPFT gets back on their feet, they rebuild their transmitter, and the Klan straps 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter, and they blow it up again. So now it takes months to rebuild, and finally in January of 1971, um, 
they're ready to go back on the air. And now it's a national event, and the media is there, and Arlo Guthrie comes back to Houston to finish his song on the radio, and that's KPFD, and it's continued broadcasting ever since. Now, I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon or the Exalted Cyclops, because I often confuse their titles. But he said it was his proudest act, and that's because he understood the danger of Pacifica Radio, the power of independent media, because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it's an uncle in Iraq, whether it's an aunt in Yemen, whether it's a native elder from the Standing Rock Sioux tribe in North Dakota. When you hear someone speaking from their own experience, it changes you. I'm not saying you agree with that person. I mean, how often do we even agree with our family members? But you begin to understand where they're coming from. It makes it much less likely that you'll want to destroy them. It's that understanding that's the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it is wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take the media back. You know, how is it used as a weapon? A few weeks ago, my brother, journalist David Goodman, and I, uh, who I write books with, also my colleague from Democracy Now! Uh, uh, the last 20 years, Dennis Moynihan is here. He's live streaming Democracy Now! on KFFR and for Democracy Now! and uh, for the uh, whole Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and everything else that's going out uh, into the ether right now. And I want to thank Dennis, who also co-authors um, um, our books together. And you'll see him around because we'll be signing books after, and Dennis is co-author of our latest book, Democracy Now!, 20 Years Covering the Movements Changing America. But um, David and I were in Albany, New York, the capital of New York, and we were each doing a panel that was chaired by Bob Schieffer. How many of you are like expats from the United States? Very interesting. So Bob Schieffer is a big guy on one of the corporate networks, CBS. He just retired. He was anchor of the CBS Evening News for years and then the Sunday morning show. He just left. And <clears throat> he moderates the presidential debates. And I, both David and I in our different panels were citing statistics about how the media has gotten it so wrong. So I went back to oh, the eve of the invasion of Iraq. February 5th, 2003, six weeks before the invasion, was the day Colin Powell, then US Secretary of State, the general, gave that speech at the United Nations, that push for war that was a nail in the coffin for so many, because he had a lot of credibility. Colin Powell and the George W. Bush administration was dragging his feet on war. He didn't necessarily endorse the idea that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. But this speech sealed the deal. He said the evidence was in, that Bush had WMD and was an imminent threat to the United States. Colin Powell would later say this speech was a blot on his career. He deeply regretted this speech, but it was a critical turning point because this is the point six weeks before war, the country is deciding whether 
to endorse it or not, whether we should go to war. And half the population was for war, half against. So a group called FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, the media watch group FAIR.org, did a study of the four major nightly newscasts, the NBC Nightly News, the CBS Evening News, the ABC World News Tonight, and the PBS NewsHour, the Public Broadcasting NewsHour. And they looked at that two weeks, the time when Noam Chomsky talks about the media manufacturing consent, manufacturing consent for war. Two weeks of interviews on those four network evening newscasts that determine public opinion. There were 393 interviews around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Half the population for, half against, hmm, three. Three of almost 400. This is no longer a mainstream media. This is an extreme media beating the drums for war. So I said this, and Bob was sitting over here, and he was the moderator, um, and he really prides himself on civil discussion. And he said, Amy, I have to stop you here. It was the first time we met. And I'm thinking, oh, he's going to say, I alone conducted a number of interviews, and I would like it if he would correct me. And he said, I really have to object here. I said, why, Bob? You actually did more you're yourself at CBS than I'm saying here, than this study cited. He said, no. So I said, so why are you objecting? And he said, I don't understand your point. I said, well, there are 393 interviews at a time when the country's making up their mind whether to go to war, and there's only three with anti-war leaders, three of almost 400. And Bob Schieffer says, the Secretary of State had just spoken. We have the Secretary of State. You want us to bring on anti-war leaders? And you know, I was, he truly was surprised, and so was I. And I said, um, actually, Bob, I think there's no one who would have appreciated that more in hindsight than Colin Powell himself, right? He said he now considers it a blot on his career. That's what the media is for, to hold those in power accountable. That is our job. especially in times of war, is to dig deep, to bring out the facts, not to be a party to the parties, but to be apart from them. And yes, of course. And I ask Bob, you know, in the United States, we don't have state media. But if we did, how would it be any different? So, he said we'd have to agree to disagree. But that's what I mean by the media being used as a weapon of war. And let me take it right through to today. I mean, I'll give lots of examples of this, but President Trump has decided to put the media in his, in its, in, uh, in the crosshairs of the Trump administration to target the media. He calls us the enemy of the American people. And I didn't think that you would put us in the same category as CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, MSNBC, but he puts all of the media in one enemy camp. And the media is standing up against that because he's personally targeting them, right? He is calling out names. You know, during the campaign, um, reporters had to get security guards. They were so afraid as he would hold these mass rallies. And journalists were afraid to go back to their cars afterwards alone as people would turn around at these rallies, as President Trump would say after, oh, uh, uh, one of his supporters punched out a Black Lives 
uh, matter activist, he would say he would pay their legal bills if they were arrested. Yet people were afraid. Uh, journalists were scared. This really plays out in real life. Um, so he calls the media the enemy of the American people. He talks about the failing New York Times, talks about fake news, CNN, and the media takes it personally. And they fight back, and they get a backbone, and they talk about, well, they sound a little like democracy now. You know, the, the media is essential to the functioning of a democratic society, and you hear this intoned in the media all the time, and it's very, very important. People are learning repeatedly every day about the First Amendment and what it means. Um, <clears throat> and frankly, I don't really get it, and I hesitate to say this publicly, but I don't get why Trump doesn't stop for just a week. Because the reflexive response of the establishment media is to wrap itself around the establishment. And they would do it with him as well. But he's hitting them so hard all the time that they can't. They've got to defend themselves. And he wouldn't have a better friend. So they're asking serious questions, except when it comes to two issues, climate change, and war. So let me give you the examples of war. It was weeks into his administration when President Trump, you may remember the 59 Tomahawk missiles that he fired into the Syrian airfield. Uh, from two naval vessels off the coast of Syria. And I came home that night, turned on the TV, and I turned on MSNBC, the most progressive of the networks, right? So I'm not talking Fox here. Um, I'm talking MSNBC. And the Pentagon had provided the video footage, you know, this goes way back, George H.W. Bush and then the whole embedding process, you know, uh, the Pentagon called it uh, spectacular success. When you embed reporters in the front lines of troops, they get the coverage, they're with the troops, they're eating with the troops, they're sleeping with the troops. How do you think they're gonna cover war? Um, and that started then and it keeps on going. And so we're used to this. But when you had Brian Williams on MSNBC, as the Pentagon provides the footage of the bombs, the Tomahawk missiles uh, being shot off, saying in real time, we see these beautiful pictures of at night from the decks of these two US Navy vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean, I'm tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen, I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. And they are beautiful pictures of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. In 30 seconds, he used the word beauty or beautiful three times. I think Leonard Cohen would be rolling over in his grave. As Brian Williams of MSC, NBC talked about the beauty of the bomb attack on Syria. The next day, Fareed Zakaria of CNN would say, Donald Trump became president last night. Um, and a few weeks later, Trump inexplicably dropped the largest non-nuclear bomb in the world on Afghanistan. Right, it's called the Moab, and the Pentagon dubs it the mother of all bombs. It's got like a mile air blast radius. And he uses the bomb in Afghanistan. Now, it was developed under George W. Bush. He didn't dare use this bomb. President Obama didn't use this bomb. Trump comes into office, and it just takes him weeks to drop this bomb. And again, parts of the media, they say he became president. Um, you know, we've heard now about this meeting he had in the summer with his um, military chiefs of staff, the 
Um, this is the meeting where um, it was reported that Rex Tillerson called him a moron, uh, an effing moron. And Tillerson is never, well, he refuses to confirm or deny whether he said that. And why did he call him this this summer? I'm talking Rex Tillerson, the current Secretary of State, who's the former head of the largest private oil corporation in the world. He's calling the president an effing moron. Uh, apparently, within an hour, he asked three times, if we have nuclear weapons, why don't we use them? And this is extremely frightening. Um, when you look at the revving up, the amping up of the rhetoric uh, against North Korea. This is extremely serious. Um, a few months ago, President Trump uh, issued a statement in three tweets uh, that changed military policy around trans soldiers and people who might want to be trans, people who might want to go into the military. Now, he divided it into three tweets, and the first one said something like, you know, we're gonna announce a new military policy. And then he waited something like seven or nine minutes before the second tweet and the third tweet till you understood what he was saying, that he was going to ban trans people. Um, from the US military. I mean, I could only imagine if you were a trans soldier lying in a hospital bed wounded somewhere to wake up with this message, you're out. Um, decided by a commander in chief that got out of the military how many times because of, I think it was bone spurs. Um, but in that first tweet, he didn't actually talk about trans policies, just said he's announcing a new policy, and then it was seven to nine minutes before he then said what the change was gonna be. And word has it, rumor has it, that even the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not know what this new military policy was going to be. It was just he was announcing, and that at the Pentagon there was this moment of terror in that five to seven minutes was he announcing that the US was bombing North Korea. I mean, this is how out of control it is. And if you think that Americans think, well, in the end, they can control their president. It's not just about the president of the United States. It's the back and forth with the leader of North Korea and how he will respond. Um, this is extremely serious, this issue of war. Um, and many believe that we are closer to war than we have ever been. Um, right now with North Korea. Closer to nuclear war is what I mean. And what does the military do? And uh, what does the media do? Well, you think they will ask serious questions, but here are the examples of what they do when the US, even under the president they are asking the most questions of, we see how the media responds. This is how the media is used as a weapon of war. But I wanna go back to that story I told you about KPFT in the Petro Metro in Houston, Texas, that's now been on the air for what, over almost 50 years. Um, I told you a story about history, about the Ku Klux Klan, what, like 50, 60 years ago. Um, I cannot believe we're talking about the Ku Klux Klan today. In 2017, that we're talking about the active Klan in the United States, that we're talking about young white men, hundreds of them marching over the campus in University of Virginia in Charlottesville with their tiki torches, with torches. I say tiki torches because even the tiki torch company said, stop using our torches. <laughs> um, but what's more frightening than if they were wearing white hoods and sheets, was that they feel safe enough not to cover their faces. President Trump has ripped open the underbelly of hate in America. I mean, it has always been an undercurrent and it surges at different times. But what he is doing now is frightening. Whether he was in the campaign, uh, talking about helping people who beat up Black Lives Matter activists, or when 
A white supremacist plows his car into a crowd and kills a young woman, 31, 32 years old, named Heather Heyer, who on her Facebook page said, if you are not outraged, you are not paying attention. Her favorite color, purple, which everyone wore at the memorial service the next week, when this white supremacist plows his car into a crowd of anti-racist activists and kills one young woman and injures scores of other people. Did President Bush respond the way he did recently in New York when he immediately labeled the person a terrorist who drove into cyclists and people who are walking along the Hudson River and demanded a, once again a crackdown on immigration policy? No, he talked about some of the very fine people who were in that crowd and he wasn't talking about the anti-racists. He talked about the violence coming from both sides. When people said, we've got to start dealing with gun control once again, with massacre after massacre, and with the people who are carrying weapons there, he said, this isn't the time or the place. You don't do this when people suffer so quickly. Immediately, though, in New York, he talked about cracking down on immigration. Yes, the message is being very clearly sent, and it makes so many people afraid, and yet, it also mobilizes people. It is just astounding what has happened since Donald Trump became president, right? That was on January 20th, and major protests happened on that day. In fact, as we speak, the J20 group of protesters and some reporters who were arrested are facing 75 years in jail for their protests on Inauguration Day. The next day, Five, 600,000 people, mainly women, at the inauguration site in Washington, D.C. came out. Now, this is interesting, because you know what happened on that day. Trump has his inauguration. His crowd is something like 180,000, which is perfectly respectable. But he is enraged when people show the contrast between his crowd and President Obama's crowd nine years before, right? He is obsessed with the size of President Obama's crowd. <laughs> he wants to erase everything that has the signature of Obama. He wants to erase Obama. I mean, if you want to look at all that he has done, it's as if he has a list, he was given a list of everything that Obama has done, the rules, the laws, and one by one, and in some cases, very successfully, and the media is hardly covering this, they talk about the fact, despite there's a Republican Congress, House, Senate, and President, he's not been able to pass one single major piece of legislation. That's true. But he, his administration is systematically rolling back decades, especially when it comes to the environment, decades of rules that have been written to guarantee a safe air land and safe air land and water. This is Scott Pruitt, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, who was formerly the Oklahoma Attorney General, who sued the EPA 14 times, who tries to wipe out the EPA and now is the head of it, doing it from the inside. Um, they are massively moving on the U.S. government. I mean, Rex Tillerson at the State Department, something like 60% of the high-level <laughs> positions uh, in the State Department have not been filled. Ambassadors and sub-ambassadors around the world, these positions are not being filled. Now, what happens when you don't fill those positions, when you start to shrink down the Department of State? Well, that's supposed to be the diplomatic wing of the government. And then you have the Pentagon, which you're pouring billions and billions of more dollars into. Then you only have one solution. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you don't have a diplomatic wing, but you have your entire toolkit, military, you know what the reaction is going to be to any situation in the world. This is an extremely serious situation. And even though many are saying that it's Rex Tillerson and John Kelly, now the chief of staff, and Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis, as he calls himself even, 
These are three generals who are surrounding, usually civilian positions, who are surrounding the president. And people are saying they are the adults in the room. Rex Tillerson is eviscerating the State Department. John Kelly came out of DHS, leading the anti-immigrant moves at the Department of Homeland Security. Mattis is the head of the military. And no, we don't usually have a general as the secretary. Um, as the, as, the secret, as, the Pent as the Pentagon chief. He had to get a waiver because we usually have civilians in charge of the military. That's what a democracy looks like. So these are very serious times. And um, we have President Trump pushing for war and a media that is oppositional until it comes to war, until it comes to war and the issue of climate change. Now, you might say, no, the media has been very fair on this issue, right? Well over 95% of the world's scientists say human beings are involved with the warming of the planet. This is accepted science, except in the United States. Um, in the United States, when you have these discussions on television, which they rarely do, it's, it's like every time we talked about a, the round earth, we had someone on from the Flat Earth Society for balance. When it comes to climate change, what we need is the meteorologists, right, the weathermen on television and women talking about the connection between the horrific weather events, the climate catastrophes that we've experienced, the connections between these, they flash two words, severe weather, extreme weather. What about flashing the words climate change? What about flashing the words global warming? It is so critical that the people that most people tune into television for, you know, just what to wear each day, what's the weather gonna be, that they make these connections. I was just talking to a meteorologist from Belgium named Jill Peters, um, who was at the Climate Change Conference. She started a new organization called Climate Without Borders. And she says, it's our responsibility. We're the be most beloved people on television and the ones that people trust the most. We have got to talk about climate change because, I mean, people are smart, but when you talk about Fires in the Northwest, in California, these fires that are ripping through and killing I don't know how many people at this point. When you talk about flooding in places like Houston, Texas and Florida, not to mention what's happened in the Caribbean and in Puerto Rico. I mean, not to mention what has happened in India in Pakistan, in Nepal, and Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, a third of the country is underwater. In the last months, over 1,200 people have died from flooding in India, Pac in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Now, who's gonna link drought, fires, and flooding? You have to have the scientists, the meteorologists, people showing that all of these disparate weather events are connected. It is that serious. The fate of the planet is at stake. But in our media, and again, I'm not talking Fox. I'm talking MSNBC. I'm talking CNN. They almost never make the connection between these hurricanes and climate change. I'm just going to ask you not to take any more flash pictures, if you don't mind. OK, sorry. Although, thank you for your interest. Um, uh, but um, climate change and the weather, um, MSNBC, CNN, why they don't make this connection, how people are going to understand this. These are the challenges that we face, and they matter. People in the rest of the world talk about this all the time. People who are at the target end. I mean, we too in the United States are at the target end. We're experiencing climate change. But look at, um, 
Oh, Democracy Now! has been at all the cops since Copenhagen. So 10 conference of parties, UN summits, bringing you a young man, a young teenager from the Maldives who looks into the camera to speak to the world and says, you are drowning my country as the sea levels rise. People from sub-Saharan Africa who speak to the media there, and there are not many US media there. And they say, you are cooking our continent. This matters. And we come from the most powerful country on Earth, the historically greatest greenhouse gas emitter. It is absolutely critical that we accept our responsibility for what has happened before and for what's happening currently. Right as we headed off to the COP this year in Bonn, our first day, we stopped in the occupied forest, um, the Hambacher Forest, and some of you may have been there. But we made our way in past the barricades. Um, we went to see the villages of uh, people in the tree houses. And I thought it was so interesting, the young activists, some of them have been there for years. They say, don't make it look like we're forest people, that we just want to separate ourselves from society and live in this way. I mean, yes, they're living sustainably, they're using renewable energy, solar power, etc. They say, we're not here to stay. We don't want to stay here. But we want to make sure that the Hambacher forest stays here. That's why we're here. We are a resistance group. We're not here to establish a new society forever, separate from the rest of the world. Um, but to see them there, in the last 10% of this ancient forest that has been eaten away by the Hambach mine, the largest open pit coal mine in Europe, apparently the largest open pit any kind of mine, in Europe with these, um, these excavators that are the largest in the world. I mean, to see them there in these open pit mines and you see a crane or a bulldozer next to them, they look like matchbox cars. The first day of the COP conference, Thousands of people, maybe someone here, um, surged onto the open pit mine and actually stopped RWE from excavating, from mining for that day or that afternoon, calling attention, <laughs> calling attention to what's happening and mainly calling attention to the fact that just down the road from the UN Climate Summit where the world's leaders were gathered was this massive coal mining operation. We have to look locally before we do anything and look at the global implications of that. So once we went to see what was happening and did our report on the occupied forest when you can check it out at democracynow.org, we came back on Monday for the only session, and this has never happened before, the one session of the US climate delegation. It was last Monday afternoon. People were lining up all afternoon to go into the session. Um, and it was very clear what it was. The headline was something like, you know, the US delegation presenting coal, nuclear, and gas, uh, the argument for it. So we got online with the press, you know, you all have your credentials, and then um, civilian society had another line. Immediately, the US embassy came over to the Democracy Now! team and put their hands over our lens. We said, excuse me, like this is a public event and we are in the press line. And of course the UN press knows democracy now. We are the most consistent US coverage of these cops for 10 years. And I think they pulled the new US administration side. No, you cannot select them out. They cover climate change, whether you believe in it or not. Um, 
And so we made our way, we made our way into the room and it was fascinating. They didn't know what to do because they say it's first come, first serve, but clearly the first line of 100 people were all mainly young activists, so what are they going to do? Um, eventually, after being concerned, they're keeping the room just basically open with the press at the very back. Now, usually the press can sit wherever they want because they're gonna ask questions during the session, but they have pushed them to the back, which means all the activists will fill all the rest of the rows. So they're in a terrible bind. The room stays empty for a long time because they're not letting anyone in. And so two senators stride in on their own, two Democratic senators from some of the hardest hit fire states, Washington and Oregon, Kate Brown and Jay Inslee. They march in, the press is all there, uh, we have nothing else to do, and they make their statement saying this is a sham, this is a sideshow, and now the US Embassy is in big trouble. They have got to start this event, or who else is gonna come in to speak to the press? And so uh, the governors stride out, and finally they start letting people in. And the whole room fills, and then the panel comes out. It is President Trump's climate advisor, George David Banks. It is Vice President Pence's policy aide, Francis Brooke. It is a spokesperson from Peabody Energy, ask any Native American about Peabody and mining in America on Native lands. Uh, it is a representative, an Obama administration or an Obama era official who is now cashing in on gas. Uh, and he represents, I think it's called Tellurion. Coal, gas, and nuclear. It's a representative of a nuclear company that's actually based in Corvallis, Oregon, but they can't put any of these nuclear plants in Oregon because the people have had a referendum and it's a no nuke zone. Uh, so their hope is to transport these highly mobile nuclear units to sub-Saharan Africa. That's where they see the hope. So it's nuclear, gas, and coal, and they begin their session. Um, they each, as one Mexican activist came over to me after, he said, what is this, the CVS shopping network? They're just selling their wares and then the White House will walk out and that's their presence before they leave the UN Climate Summit. And that's precisely what they did. They took questions from the press and I asked the last question <clears throat> and I just said, you know, I want a simple yes or no answer from every member of this panel. Are you for President Trump pulling the US out of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the nuclear representative said no. Uh, gas representative said no. Um, the head of the US Energy Association, that's gas, nuclear, coal, and all you know, fossil fuel representative said yes, he was for it. Um, and coal, she wouldn't say. Uh, I asked Vice President Pence's representative, and he said, we're here representing the president, as did the president. They said, of course we do. But interestingly, they had four corporate executives, and two of them said they, half of them said they didn't even endorse what the president uh, was doing. Um, but that was the end of the session. And when I got a chance to question uh, David Banks, President Trump's climate advisor, later inviting him on Democracy Now! as he stood in the backdrop of our broadcast one day, stood there for half of the show waving, but would not come on the show. I kept turning around saying, come. We were speaking also with Kumi Naidu, uh, former head of Greenpeace International from South Africa. And Kumi was saying, come, come, be on the show. Let's have a discussion. But when I went up to David Banks afterwards and said to him, you know, just explain why this was the presence of the US here, um, pushing coal, nuclear, and gas. And he said, I wanna make sure they have a level playing field with everything else that's talked about here. That is what represents, this is the administration that represents many of you, uh, if you're from the United States at the Climate Summit. Um, 
so that's what happened there. But most importantly, what happened are the thousands of people who come from the most besieged places on Earth, who are dead serious, who try to make it every year. Um, some of them travel like scientist Kevin Anderson from London. He will not take a plane, hasn't taken one since 2004. Uh, we saw him first in Poland. I don't know how many hours or days he had traveled to get there. He said, you get a lot of scientific research done on these trains. But he says, yes, it's a matter of changing our lifestyle as well. So this is what was happening on this end. Now I want to talk about the other end. You have the anti-coal activists of Germany. Um, you have the Trump administration pushing for more coal, making sure there's a level playing field. Back in the United States, there was an extremely um, sophisticated, activated movement to stop the pipelines crisscrossing America, challenging the fossil fuel economy of the most powerful country on Earth, which is why I want to get to the standoff at Standing Rock. Um, but I want to start on September 6th of this year. Now, Hurricane Harvey had just hit. It was right after Labor Day weekend. Democracy Now! went down to Houston. Um, that had flooded out so many areas, particularly the fence line communities. I didn't say front line, I said fence line. These are the poorest communities that are along the fences of the largest petrochemical refineries in the country, like the Latino community in Baytown on the fence line of ExxonMobil, the second largest refinery in the United States. When these refineries shut down as a result of these hurricanes, it's the most dangerous time, or when they start back up because then they are using this moment to do something they're not supposed to be doing, which is releasing toxic chemicals, though it's easier now, and a lot of rules were waived under the Trump administration. And where do those chemicals go? The people who are least protected into their communities, into their water, and we took this toxic tour of the poorest communities, the most marginalized. Um, and this was right after Hurricane Harvey inundated the Caribbean and Houston, and right before Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and other Caribbean islands. And you know what's happened in Puerto Rico. It is devastating. I mean, still, I don't know this week, but something like 80 or more percent, perhaps 90 percent of the country still doesn't have electricity. San Juan got some and then lost it. Uh, and they said that while they got some, the main line that was worked on by Whitefish Energy, and you've heard of this $300 million contract that went to a company called Whitefish, named for Whitefish, Montana, the hometown of Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke. When Maria hit Puerto Rico, there were two employees of Whitefish, and they got a $300 million contract to rebuild Puerto Rico. Um, Ryan Zinke's son also had worked as an intern or something at Whitefish as well. Now that's being investigated, and the governor of Puerto Rico announced that they are pulling the contract from Whitefish. But it's not exactly clear what's happening, and they will get millions of dollars. So. Puerto Rico is devastated. And if you watch television through this time, the networks 24 hours a day were showing coverage, not quite as much of Puerto Rico as they did Florida and, uh, and, and Harvey and Houston, Har Houston hitting, uh, Harvey hitting Houston. But you saw um, a woman in the water, chest high, with a bullhorn saving people's lives, making sure people were getting out of their homes. Her name is Carmen Yulene Cruz, and she's the mayor of San Juan. <laughs> Carmen Yulene Cruz, remarkably brave. I mean, do you know how toxic this water is? Um, and it was Mayor Cruz that President Trump who has a propensity for particularly attacking women, um, went after. 
and talked about the poor people of Puerto Rico just don't want to help themselves and talked about the politicians like Cruz being lazy. And you see President Trump speak saying some of this from his golf course in Bedminster, New Jersey, as Mayor Cruz is chest deep in the water. And she, Trump was shamed into going to Puerto Rico. And then you saw the images of him hurling rolls of paper towels at hurricane survivors after he said, we cannot remain in Puerto Rico forever, which might have encouraged the independence movement in Puerto Rico, but that's not what he was trying to do. <laughs> Saying FEMA can't be here forever, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Never said that about Florida, never said that about Houston, but almost immediately said that about Puerto Rico. Well, uh, when we went to Puerto Rico to cover the devastation there, we had a conversation with Carmen Yulín Cruz after she had just called the president the hater in chief when he made this remarkable comment, we cannot keep FEMA, the military, and the first responders in PR forever. Uh, she responded, Trump is threatening to condemn us to a slow death of non-drinkable water, lack of food, lack of medicine. Uh, the mayor appealed to the United Nations, UNICEF, the world, to stand with the people of Puerto Rico, stop the genocide that will result from the lack of appropriate action of a president that just does not, does not get it because he's been incapable of looking in our eyes and seeing the pride that burns fiercely in our hearts and souls. Um, well, the playwright and the main star of Hamilton was not quite as poetic when he heard the words of President Trump. Um, and he responded, you know, Lynn manuel Miranda, in a tweet after President Trump attacked the people of Puerto Rico, calling them lazy. He says, you're going straight to hell, real Donald Trump. No long lines for you. Someone will say, right this way, sir. They'll clear a path. So that was their response to President Trump dealing with hurricane relief in Puerto Rico. But between Maria hitting and Hurricane Harvey hitting Texas, um, President Trump, chose to take a stand by going to an oil refinery in Mandan, North Dakota, standing in front of it and bragging about having pulled the US out of the Paris Climate Agreement in the midst of these hurricanes and also talking about how he had taken action. He green-lighted the Keystone XL pipeline and the Dakota Access Pipeline. By the way, just in the last few days, Keystone in South Dakota, a part of the pipeline that's been built, just leaked 210,000 gallons of oil. Exactly what people had said for years. President Obama finally stopped the Keystone XL after years of mass protests, you know, people circling the White House in one action alone, 1,200 people arrested. Um, that was President Trump's response to these climate catastrophes. And he was standing just down the road from the Mandan jail, where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Native Americans had been jailed for protest protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline. And that's what I want to talk about now, the standoff at Standing Rock. Um, it started April 1st, 2016. The unofficial historian of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, has this beautiful property along the Cannonball River in North Dakota. And she decided to open it to the resistance. The resistance to the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline, what Native Americans call the Black Snake, as it snakes its way from the back in oil fields of North Dakota taking the fracked oil from North Dakota through South Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, and then hooking up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. 
And the Native Americans said no. They were particularly concerned about it being drilled under the Missouri River, the longest river in North America that would provide um, that provides water to more than 17 million people downstream. They said it's not just about us and it's not just about Native Americans, it's about all of us. They don't call themselves protesters, they call themselves water protectors. Um, and LaDonna Brave Bulb Allard opens her property and she says anyone can come who resists. And first dozens of people come, and then scores of people, then hundreds of people, then thousands of people. The first resistance camp, hers, was called the Sacred Stone Camp. And then there was, oh, many different resistance camps that grew up because there were so many. Uh, the Red Warrior Camp and others, so many people had come. And this action, this largest unification of Native American tribes that the United States has seen in decades, um, tribes from Latin America, the United States, the First Nations of Canada, this was historic. And this is all growing through the election year of 2016 when people are really focused on the issues. You know, in the general election debates, and this I also mentioned to Bob Schieffer, who was a moderator of some of the debates. The moderators did not once raise the issue of climate change, let alone the Dakota Access Pipeline or the standoff at Standing Rock. It, to this, Bob Schieffer answered, we should do more on climate change. Um, and that's important, that's a start. Uh, but the resistance kept on growing. Now, we were covering it from afar, but on Labor Day weekend a year ago, in 2016, um, Democracy Now!, we made our way to North Dakota to be on the ground covering what was happening. And it was amazing to film. I mean, we would cover these mass civil disobedience protests, people marching through the back roads, the rural roads of North Dakota. Native American elders, they'd start with a water ceremony and they would often carry glasses of water and they would be met by a fully militarized sheriff's department. I mean, we're talking the rural back roads of North Dakota. They had MRAPs, they had tanks, they had automatic weapons, they had drones and they're facing off against their neighbors. I mean, sometimes the water protectors would say, okay, you're protecting the pipeline, but what about also protecting us? Um, they would say, this water is also for you. It's not just for us, it's for your children. It's not just for ours. And you know that scene of militarized police departments. You know it from Ferguson, right? You know it from that people's uprising back in 2014, August 9th, 2014, when Darren Wilson, a white police officer, right around noon on that day, high noon, guns down a young African-American 18-year-old named Michael Brown, who has just graduated from high school, headed off to community college, and instead he's killed by a white police officer. And his body, his corpse is left to bake in the hot August sun hour after hour after hour after hour. And the people rose up. And you know these images because the media did go there <coughs> and showed these fully militarized St. Louis area police departments facing off against an enraged community saying we are not animals. We are people too, taking their stand. Black Lives Matter. This is recycling in America today. You take the weapons from Iraq and Afghanistan and you give them to the police departments of the United States. Now, <coughs> even some police chiefs are saying enough. Uh, Juan Gonzalez and I, Juan, amazing journalist who has been with Democracy Now! all 21 years of Democracy Now! Um, we recently interviewed Norm Stamper, a former police chief of 
Seattle, Washington. He presided over the Battle of Seattle back in 1999. You remember under President Clinton, the World Trade Organization met there, and thousands of people came from around the world. I mean, high school kids from Seattle, nurses, doctors, environmentalists, labor leaders, farmers from fa France, um, all gathered in the streets and said no to this supranational organization that can, represents corporations that can overturn the laws of democratically elected legislatures by saying that's a barrier to trade. So if you don't want, oh, genetically modified food, they can say, no, that is a barrier to trade. You are WTO illegal. Uh, and people said no. And that battle took place in the streets of Seattle. And Norm Stamper was the police chief. They sprayed so much gas on the protesters pepper spray, mace, gas, that they had to go to other states to replenish their supply. Seattle had never seen anything like this before. And at the end of this basically police riot, Norm Stamper was ousted, as he should have been. But he has gone on to become one of the major voices in the United States for police reform. He says it was the worst mistake of his life. He said, when we're looking at people in the crosshairs, we forget there are neighbors, there are kids, there are doctors, our nurses, our librarians, there are farmers. We forget they are the enemy. And this is why we have to reevaluate the arming of our police departments with weapons grade, you know, military weapons. I mean, when you think they're trying to stop violence. Look at the level of violence in the United States. I mean, President Trump was just in Japan on his Asia trip trying to push billions of dollars of weapon sales on Japan in the midst of one of the major massacres of the last weeks. We have them almost every week in the United States. 33 1,000 people die a year in the United States of gun violence. In Japan, it's under 10 a year. In the United States, it's 33,000 people. Um, and just a, a side issue on these horrific massacres. Every time you hear about one, think domestic violence. Think how important it is to take the issue of domestic violence seriously because more often than not, in the majority of these cases, these men, who are most likely men, who engage in these acts of gun violence have hurt or killed their partners, the women in their lives. You know, whether we're talking about Me Too and the whole movement against sexual harassment and sexual assault, that could conceivably take down the President of the United States. Or whether we're talking about gun violence in the streets of the United States. This last massacre, not even the latest, the one in Sutherland Springs a few Sundays ago, where a 26-year-old former active duty member of the US Air Force, and sadly, so often these massacres are committed by former US military. Devin Patrick Kelly, the white 26-year-old former active duty member of the US Air Force, who killed 26 people and injured 20 at this church in Sutherland Springs, Texas who had a gun apparently legally just a few years before, had beaten his wife and fractured the skull of his 18-month toddler stepson. He was confined to base or jail on the military base where he served for a year, and that didn't go into the national instant criminal background check system that would allow him to get a gun. This assault, domestic violence matters. It matters in itself. It's not just a red flag for future violence in public. Private violence has to be taken as seriously as public violence. But. <laughs> the, 
a small critical digression from the militarization of the United States and how different we are than the rest of the world and how important it is that people, especially in our country in the United States, understand this. But that's what the people of Standing Rock were up against. They're up against this militarized police department and they continue to march, they continue to get arrested, um, and their numbers only grew. So that weekend, Labor Day weekend, a year ago, Democracy Now! went on the ground, started filming all of this, and these protests were amazing. And then on Saturday, September 3rd, 2016, we were covering, um, it was Labor Day weekend, so it was an extended weekend. People didn't expect the bulldozers to be in operation holiday weekend, and a group of Native Americans were going to plant their native flags on an area they had called their sacred ground. They said it was their sacred burial site. And as they went to plant their flags, they see the bulldozers right there operating at full tilt. They were shocked. So we're filming. They go up on the property, and they stand in front of the bulldozers. And I mean, this is such a remarkably brave act. Do you know these are mega machines? You know, not as big as the exca excavator in the Hambach mine tiny in comparison, but massively big compared to a human being. And to see a native woman elder and a child standing in front of this bulldozer, it made me think back three days before the US invasion of Iraq in another part of the Middle East, it was March 16, 2003 in Gaza, to a young American woman named Rachel Corey who came from Evergreen College in Washington State. And she was part of the International Solidarity Movement. And she had befriended a Palestinian pharmacist and his family. And she and other activists had put on those construction vest orange fluorescent jackets because Israeli military bulldozers had come to demolish his home. And they were standing there to try to prevent that from happening. And she stood just like these native elders in front of an Israeli military bulldozer made by Caterpillar in the United States, and she was crushed to death. And that's what I thought about as we were filming the Native Americans standing in front of these bulldozers. You just can't overestimate how dangerous the churning of this earth is. But this time the bulldozers pulled back. They pulled back from the people, and the people kept on marching forward, and more came from the resistance camps as they heard what was going on, and it was just an amazing sight. One, two, three, four, five, six bulldozers pushing back. I mean, people were so shocked that they were excavating this site because, well, a judge was about to rule on the Standing Rock Sioux, the whole conflict. And he had said, like the day before, a few days before, okay, if you say this is your sacred burial ground, prove it. You draw a map for me. And they complied, and they drew a map for the judge. And the judge gave it to the other side, as judges do, to Energy Transfer Partners. Energy Transfer Partners, which owns the Dakota Access Pipeline. Energy Transfer Partners, who were owned by Kelsey Warren. Um, Kelsey Warren, who, oh, when Rick Perry ran for president, twice, the former governor of Texas, who's now the Secretary of Energy, who just made a massive coal deal in Ukraine. Um, Rick Perry, when he ran for governor twice, bankrolled his presidential run to the tune of $6 million. He is now the Secretary of Energy. Um, gave the map to energy transfer partners, and the Native Americans thought, so the company leapfrogged over from where they were to this area to excavate, to change the facts on the ground. So when the judge ruled in the next few days, it would be a moot point. I mean, the land would be already destroyed. And it just infuriated people. So they came up and they kept marching and they pushed the bulldozers back. And it was an amazing scene. And it was then that the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleash dogs on the protesters, on the water protectors. Dogs. And so Democracy Now! kept filming. People were being bitten. The guards would throw the dogs into the crowd. You'd even see sometimes a dog flinch, but they'd have to bite their way out of the crowd. 
They bit the horses, they bit the people, um, and people were being maced by other guards. But they kept moving forward. I mean, we filmed a dog with its nose and mouth dripping with blood. And even though they were beaten, bitten, maced, pepper sprayed, the people prevailed on that day at an unacceptably high price. But finally, the bulldozers pulled back, the guards pulled back, they got in their trucks and their cars, and they pulled away. We posted... <laughs> we posted that video online that night. Within 24, 48 hours, there were 14 million views. Now, this gives the lie to the corporate executives on the networks. You know, I'm invited on some of these networks to comment sometimes, um, who say, people's eyes glaze over when you talk climate change. Now, this shows the intense interest in these struggles around a sustainable planet, around climate change, around one of the greatest threats to all of our existence. People do care. Any corporate executive would have drooled to have those kind of, what do they call them, eyeballs. Uh, on their product. 14 million views. People were interested. So we had to go back to New York and we continued to broadcast um, about what was happening there. And then the governor of North Dakota at the time, Governor Dalrymple, on Thursday night called out the National Guard. The judge was going to rule on the following Friday, the day after. It did not look good for the tribe. <clears throat> oh, and then quietly, the authorities in North Dakota issued an arrest warrant for me, but I didn't know that at the time. So the next day, Friday, um, <clears throat> we broadcast our show, and then Nermeen Sheikh and I, who co-host Democracy Now!, headed to uh, Canada. We weren't fleeing. Um, <clears throat> We were invited to the Toronto International Film Festival because there was a new film premiering about the life of I.F. Stone, who's a, this great muckraking journalist, who, when teaching young people, said, if you're going to remember two words, re remember governments lie. If you can remember three words, remember all governments lie. <laughs> so <clears throat> it was telling the story of his great muckraking life, and then it was talking about journalistic organizations that were continuing in, um, in his tradition. So it was profiling Democracy Now!, and they asked us to come up and speak after the film. And I thought about it, and I thought, this is the time to speak. We just come from the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle. People really care about Native Americans in Canada, First Nations. We had just been an eyewitness to this. This would be an opportunity. Anyway. That was Friday. Friday evening, the judge ruled a routing of the tribe. I mean, completely against the tribe. Um, worst decision for the Standing Rock Sioux. Now, that week also, Trump had made, uh, President Obama made this historic trip to Asia, and his last stop was Laos. And he held a democracy forum for young Asians from all over Asia to teach them about democracy. And the last question was from a young Malaysian woman. And she raised her hand and she said, President Obama, what about the Dakota Access Pipeline? She asked him a question that no American journalist had publicly asked President Obama. And he answered eloquently about the oppression of Native Americans for centuries. Um, and then uh, as he was wrapping up, he said, oh, as for the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, uh, I'd have to get back to my team and get back to you on that. Well, he came back to the United States and reportedly he saw the video of the dogs. It wasn't lost on the first African-American president of the United States, their significance. I mean, when we posted that video, we also interviewed Winona LaDuke, great indigenous activist from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota who said, Governor Dalrymple, you are not George Wallace. This is not Alabama. This is not 1965. We are through. So Obama knew what was happening at that point, leading up to the judge's decision. It's his Justice Department that's prevailing. They're about to pop their champagne corks. They have won. 15 minutes later, an unprecedented three-agency 
letter is released from his own Justice Department that had just prevailed, Interior Department, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And they said, wait, hold everything. So the tribe is suffering from whiplash now. Worst decision, and then what do you mean wait? They're saying, well, we have to see whether Native Americans were consulted, whether there was a proper environmental impact statement. So this is a great decision. Well, it looks like Obama's going to slow down this building of the pipeline and maybe not grant the permit for digging this under the Missouri River. So this is a very big victory for the Standing Rock Sioux. So we're in Canada, right? And the next day, we're invited to the University of Toronto. So uh, it's a crowd like this. Well, no one's like you guys, but you know, it's like a, um, a couple hundred people. And we're giving speeches. And um, I'm in the middle of my speech. And I get a text. And it says, you're under arrest. No, 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 really. It said, like, there's an arrest warrant out for you. And I, had, I thought, did someone just send me this from the audience? Is this like some kind of scam? Or, or is it spam? Or is this real? But I do see it's a North Dakota number. And you know, <clears throat> it's not like you'll be arrested immediately if there's arrest warrant. But I do know that if there is an arrest warrant for you and you have interaction with the police or the FBI or border guards and that arrest warrant is in the system, you will be taken. And the thing is, I'm in Canada, and I have to get over the border. So I think if I can race that arrest warrant from going into the system, maybe I can make it home. So I just you know, looked out on the crowd and said, could someone call me a cab? <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't want to say what was happening, call attention to the situation. But I did get to the airport, and I made it back to New York and um, safely. But you know, it was true. I learned there was an arrest warrant for me, but I didn't take it personally. I really thought it was a message that was being sent to all journalists, do not go to North Dakota, which is exactly why we all had to be there. Now, I also felt... <laughs> I also felt that... Uh, I wanted to send a message to young independent reporters that they don't have to get a record when you put things on the record. We had to challenge this. Because, I mean, if you're a young reporter, independent, how are you going to go somewhere where you're going to immediately end up in jail? It's going to obviously discourage you if you don't have the institutional backing, the resources. And we had to call the bluff of the authorities. And so we headed back to North Dakota a few weeks later. Um, we landed on a Friday uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota. And as we landed, the prosecutors announced um, they would be quashing the arrest warrant and <clears throat> dropping the charges against me, which was good. Oh, but they would be bringing more serious charges against me of riot. What, like I'm a one-woman riot? <laughs> what are they talking about? Um, so... I call my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before, and I said, I don't understand. What does this mean? What, what do I face? He said, I mean, at worst, a year in jail. I said, a year in jail? I don't know about your life, sir, but... Uh, so I said, well, what does this mean? And he said, well, you'll be arraigned Monday at 1.30. I said, well, at least that gives us three days to cover the protests. So we're in North Dakota. And then I said, now, it's just automatic? He said, yeah, the judge just rubber stamps all you know, these charges. And I said, oh, a judge is involved over the weekend? He said, no, it's not a, I said, judge means discretion, right? And so he says, no, 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 in this case, it's rubber stamped. All these charges with all these people, they're rubber stamped. But then the judge uses discretion in trials or whatever else, and plea bargaining or whatever. I said, no, no, no. A judge means this is not a done deal. So we issued a press release. So I said, what is the name of the judge? Um, and we said this judge would be deciding about whether to sign off on these charges that would lead to my arraignment. And then we continued to cover the protests. Um, there was a lot of media attention. Now, on Monday morning, you know, the show must go on. And how many of you watch or listen to a Read Democracy now? Fantastic. <laughs> 
but it still looks like at least half the audience doesn't. So you can get us on your public radio station here. You can get us on public television. We grew from nine radio stations the first year, 21 years ago, to over 1,400 public radio and television stations today. And online, millions of people access us at Democracy Now! So check it all out. An hour a day, grassroots, global, independent, investigative, unembedded, international news hour. Um, <laughs> Um, and you can sign up on our website to get our daily digest, our headlines every day, and media alerts, and everything like that. I think we are sending around daily digest where you can sign up here. I don't know if you can text the words internationally, democracy now, one word to 66866, but that'll automatically sign you up. I'm not sure if it works here in Germany. But, um, so we had to do the show. It's 8 in the morning every day Eastern time in New York, which meant 7 in the morning North Dakota time. So Dennis Moynihan, who's doing this live stream, um, arranged a satellite truck would come up from Minneapolis. And then we had to locate this truck and do the show. So we decided to broadcast from across the street from the Mandan courthouse in jail, where I'd have to turn myself in right after. So. We broadcast from this church property, uh, and behind us was the courthouse, the jail, and the Ten Commandments in between. <laughs> and we began the show. And we interviewed um, Dave Archambault, who is the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Like Trump is the 45th president of the United States, he's the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux. And I asked him, <coughs> Chairman Dave, have you ever been arrested? Um, he said, I was a few months ago. We were doing civil disobedience. And I said, and what happened? He said, it was a low-level misdemeanor. I said, so what happened? He said, I was strip searched. I was put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. I mean, this guy is the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux, and he was strip searched and jailed for a low-level misdemeanor. I interviewed Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle. She is the pediatrician of the Standing Rock Reservation. And I asked her if she was arrested. And she said, oh, she was one of the first. Because, you know, she cared about the health of the children. And I said, what happened? She said, low-level misdemeanor. I said, so what happened? And so she said, well, I was strip searched. I was put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed, you know, right there in the Mandan jail behind me. I mean, how much humiliation can a people take? I was at the... Bismarck Airport one time, I was reading a magazine before getting on an airplane, uh, and a guy came up to me and he said, don't think I don't know who you are. And I said, oh, who are you? And he said, I was one of the guards at the, at the Labor Day um, standoff when the dogs were released. And I said, and did you release the dogs on the Native Americans? He said, no. We were as shocked as they were. He said, Energy Transfer Partners, Dakota Access Pipeline, hired several security firms. And he said, you don't think I get it that we've committed hundreds of massacres against these people, then we release dogs on them? You don't think I get why they're angry? You know, never assume, based on a pers person's position, what their position will be. So... Um, back to the show. We finish the hour, and we're getting ready to go across to the courthouse. And lots of media are now paying attention. There's a lot of pressure. Um, New York Times is covering this, Los Angeles Times, Al Jazeera. It's on the BBC homepage. Uh, Vogue magazine was covering this. <laughs> and... I get a call from North Dakota Public Radio right before going to court that, and you know, it's a small state, they know all the players, this is a long time host, he says you're not gonna be arraigned. The judge has decided not to sign off on these charges. And you know, it wasn't only me. A number of Native Americans who face felony and misdemeanor charges had those charges dropped that day. This is what happens when the media spotlight shines in the right direction. This, this is what 
happens when you have the good kind of reality television. This is the kind of media that we have to support. Going to where the silence is, and as you can see, it is often not very quiet. It just doesn't hit that corporate media radar screen. So that was in October. In December, the Obama administration ruled that there would be some kind of rerouting or the Dakota Access Pipeline, like the Keystone XL, would not be finished. But then President Trump was inaugurated, and one of his first acts was to greenlight the Dakota Access Pipeline. And yes, they say that the Dakota Access Pipeline is carrying that frack gas today, but that hasn't ended the struggle. I mean, the education that people have experienced in our country and around the world, the indigenous solidarity right here at COP, the number of Native Americans who had come uh, to join together with other indigenous people around the world to educate them about the victories and the losses. Um, and now there's the struggle around the Keystone Excel as well. This is a period when whether we're talking about the struggle for a cleaner planet or a struggle for a more just society when it comes to, for example, in the United States, the immigration bans, um, people massively going out to airports and fighting Donald Trump on his bans, and even the judges doing this. Um, just a quick comment. Uh, because I interviewed Brian Schatz, the senator from Hawaii, and asked him what he thought of this just a few days ago at the COP. You know that Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General of the United States, was recently on a right-wing radio talk show and asked about the fact that a federal judge from Hawaii had stopped the Muslim ban, one of two judges, the other in Washington State, Jeff Sessions said, how is it possible that a man on an island in the Pacific can stop the president of the United States? He is the attorney general of the United States. Um, this is what we face today. Whether we're talking about Muslim bans or immigration rights, I mean, the rights of immigrants in Germany all through Europe, such a pivotal issue today. People are standing up. People are uniting around issues of climate, issues of immigration, issues of war and peace, massive issues of growing inequality, LGBTQ rights. I really do think that those who care about war and peace, those who care about climate change, the fate of the planet, and racial, economic, and social injustice are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take the media back. I just want to end. <laughs> and then I think we're going to go to the back and we'll be signing books, but you don't have to get a book to come up and say hi, or uh, if you have story ideas for Democracy Now!, send them to stories at democracynow.org. We always encourage this, people to interview, issues to cover. Um, I just want to end with two stories. Um, one is when this critical moment comes, what you're doing. And it goes way back in time to 1955 to Rosa Parks. Now, that's a story that many people know. And you might say, why tell it again? Because the media even gets this famous story wrong about the civil rights activists. Rosa Parks, December 1st, 1955, sits down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, refuses to get up for a white passenger. The bus driver calls the police. They arrest her. Four days later, December 5th, 1955, she goes to court. The Montgomery Improvement Association holds its meeting to launch a bus boycott that will lead to the integration of the transportation system of Alabama. They choose as their leader a young minister who's just moved into town, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was Rosa Parks who helped to launch Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, when she died a few years ago, first African-American woman to lay in state in the US Capitol, and then her body was brought to a 
uh, church in Washington before this massive uh, funeral in Detroit. Um, I was watching CNN, and they said Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. That's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. She knew... <laughs> She knew exactly what she was doing. She was the secretary of the local NAACP. She worked under Edie Nixon. He came out of radical labor politics. He had organized with, um, with A. Philip Randolph, one of the greatest organizers of the 20th century, who organized the 1963 March on Washington where King gave his I Have a Dream speech. He organized that with Bayard Rustin, who was the black pacifist gay activist um, these are the stories we should know. But Edie Nixon, working with A. Philip Randolph, had organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the thousands of black conductors on the trains who are all called George, not because their mothers named them George, but for George Pullman, who owned the Pullman trains, and that's why they needed to be organized. Um, Edie Nixon, Rosa Parks, had been challenging the racist laws of the South for years. She had trained at the Highlander Center, bringing white and black together. King was at the Highlander Center. She knew exactly what she was doing, but the media denigrates activists. What can be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? Um, you know, if you help to build that foundation, you never know when that critical moment will come. Look at the United States right now with the Me Too movement, this powerful movement of women who are challenging abuse and challenging men in every sector of society, the most powerful men, from politicians to people in the entertainment industry to people in finance, there is no telling where this will go, considering that at least a dozen women have already accused Donald Trump of sexually assaulting or harassing them. There is no telling where this is all going. But you never know when that critical moment will come. But if you're involved with social change, you will help build that foundation that will make history, will determine the future. And that's what Rosa Parks did. And to show how brave Rosa was, go back a few months in 1955 to that summer of 1955, the summer of Emmett Till. The summer of a 14-year-old African-American boy. His mother, Mamie Till, wanted him out of Chicago for the summer, sent him to be with his aunt and uncle and cousins in Money, Mississippi. And one night, a white mob comes, rips him out of bed, said he wolf whistled at a white woman. Emmett was a stutterer, and his mother, Mamie, taught him every time you feel a stutter coming on, whistle. He ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. And when his body was dredged up and sent back to Chicago, his mother, Mamie, did something incredibly courageous. She said she wanted the casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. Thousands of people streamed past his casket and saw his distended, mutilated head, and then Jet Magazine and other black publications actually took pictures, and those pictures were published. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of our country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the images of war? For one week we saw a baby dead on the ground in Afghanistan and we learned her story, who her parents were, and we saw her photograph on the top of the fold of the surviving newspapers. If for just one week Every radio and television newscast at the top of it, they talked about a woman in Yemen who was blown up in a drone strike. Maybe she was attending a wedding party. Who'd fallen in love? What were the family that were struck in this attack? If we knew their names, 
if for just one week, everyone on their Facebook page, everyone, every tweet, every text, every email talked about a soldier dead and dying for just one week. You know, we are all a compassionate people. I do believe across the United States and across the world, people would say no. War is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. And being here in Berlin, I wanted to end in World War II, where I began. But I wanted to end with Hans and Sophie Scholl, that brother and sister. Um, he was a medical student at the University of Munich. Sophie was an undergraduate. They and their professor, Carl Huber, and other students and workers decided to form the White Rose Collective. They decided that, I mean, Hans and Sophie weren't Jewish, they were German Christians, but they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? And they thought the best they could do was to put out information so that the Germans would never be able to say we didn't know. And they put out this series of pamphlets. And on one of the pamphlets were written the words, we will not be silent. And they had these distributed far and wide, wherever they could, under cover of darkness. Oh, in alleyways, in marketplaces, in schoolyards. And then Hans and Sophie and their professor were captured. They were charged. They were tried. They were convicted. And they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of the media today, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy Now!